Good morning and thank you for joining our class this morning. Our topic is Jewish names and name changing. I hope you had a chance to see the recorded lecture that I recommended that everybody take a look at. If you didn't, it doesn't matter. I'll be summarizing a good part of it and I'm going to add some other examples. Before we begin, however, let me point out a couple of things. This particular class is being pre-recorded. I am recording it on Monday. It will be available on Tuesday. I have a previous engagement on Tuesday morning, and therefore we cannot have our Zoom discussion afterwards. I am certainly open to having a Zoom discussion in the not too distant future on Jewish family names, and perhaps all of us could share experiences from our own families. That was one of the things I asked you to think about. Uh, how did you get your family name? Do you know for sure? What's the family tradition? What does the name mean? Uh, during the month of July, things will be somewhat different. I should mention first Tuesday, the 30th of June. That happens to be our wedding anniversary, and I don't know if we're going to have a class on that day. Assume we won't, but look at the weekly e-blast. That will tell you what the plans are. At the very beginning of July, for a few days, I won't be available, but I may do some things during July. I'm officially on vacation, but I will be available to lead Friday night and Saturday morning services, which we have posted on Facebook and on YouTube. So. Jewish family names. I have a few examples here. They're for educational purposes and for fun. I'm gonna talk about some real people. Let us assume you meet a Jew whose last name is Ashkenazi. Would you not, as I would, assume this guy is an Ashkenazi Jew? Well, not necessarily. I'm going to give you an example. Israel's present foreign minister, Gabi Ashkenazi. What is his story? His father, a Sephardi Jew, no less, from Bulgaria. His mother, her family, came from Syria. Where did the name Ashkenazi come from? Maybe their family in Bulgaria came from Ashkenaz, Germany, and moving east into what is now Poland. Maybe, I think that's the answer, but you can't automatically assume. Next example, I'm gonna talk about an earlier foreign minister of Israel, known in English, happy, type time of his professional career as a diplomat as Abba Iban. How names change. What is the history of his name? Now if you look at the way his name is written out with middle initial and everything else, Abba Solomon Iban. The Solomon is not English for Shlomo, not in the slightest. He was born, no, not in England, despite the beautiful English accent, but in South Africa. His name at birth was Aubrey Solomon. Solomon was his natural father's first name. His natural father passed away. Mother took the baby back to England where her family was, remarried a man whose last name, Eban. Now, how do you spell Iban in Hebrew. Aleph, Bet, Nun. Write that out and what does it look like? Evan, which is the word for stone. So in the United States, at the United Nations, he was known as Abba Iban. In Israel, Abba Evan. Interesting, trivia to be sure, but just family names. Now I'm going to give you one example of somebody I did know. He is now Professor Emeritus of Physics at Tel Aviv University. He had a sabbatical at the University of Illinois many years ago when I was the Hillel rabbi there. 
What was his last name? Christian Kohler. Yes, a nice Jewish name. Family came from Christian Kohl, a city in Eastern Europe. His father was an Orthodox rabbi in Vienna. For whatever reason, they never changed the name. A lot of people, when they went to Israel, Hebraicized their names. But if I met a guy by the name of Christian Kohler, I wouldn't have mo for a moment assume he was Jewish. Then again, and I'm, of course, going all over the place because there's so much we could say about this. How do we spell our names? Many Jews from Eastern Europe a few generations ago, when they came west, whether they went to Germany or England or the United States, would try to spell out their names phonetically, but not exactly so. They did it with a German twist. So I'm going to give you an example of the contrast between what Jews did, let's say, in 1920 or 1940, and what Jews did in 1970 when leaving Eastern Europe. We know people from the former Soviet Union, whose last name is Waldman, V-A-L-D-M-A-N. Now, you know a lot of people in this country who have the name, and it's the same name, Waldman, because in German it would be Waldman, but they spelt it, they wrote it out in the German way. Now, I'm supposed to give myself as an example. How did I end up with the last name of Schneiderman? Now, a Schneider, and I'm being very specific here, is the Yiddish word for tailor. The fact that it's the German word for tailor is another story. Both grandfathers, both sides of the family, they were all tailors. One grandfather, my paternal grandfather, decided to go in the ladies' wear business, not the men's wear business, but still. Now, if you spell the name out in the Germanic way, S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R-M-A-N-N, -E -E it takes up a lot of space. And when he was young, my grandfather went through several stages of being in different businesses. For a while there, he was in the seltzer water business and had his name on the bottle. Well, he had to shorten the name, and that's how Schneiderman became Schneiderman. I went to a wedding several years ago, and some fella comes up to me, and he's originally from South America, and he says we have the same last name. So after talking about where he came from, and his family came from a part of Poland, and no one from my family ever came from there, he gives me his business card. How did he spell the same name? S-Z-N-A-I-D-E-R-M-A-N-N. -E -N. So we've changed our names. We have sometimes changed the spelling, sometimes changed the pronunciation, sometimes made it shorter and easier, sometimes did it in order to disguise, hide our Jewish identity. You don't want a specifically Jewish name on your business in 1930 or 1940, or maybe even in 1950. It was a different time and place. So there was a sort of Americanization, Anglicization of last names in this country. In Israel, a different approach. Get rid of your diaspora name. Get rid of your Yiddish name and make it into a Hebrew name. And for a while there, it was an absolute government policy that anyone who had a high-ranking government position had to Hebraicize his name. There were one or two exceptions that were made for very, very personal reasons because of who the father was, but this was the policy of the country. And again, understandably so. Now, where on earth do our names come from? You ask your grandparents, and I know for 99% of us, grandparents aren't around to ask. Sometimes they knew the answer and sometimes they didn't. If you had a 
place name as your last name, if your last name was London or Berlin, and I know Jewish people with names like that, it's not necessarily that you came from London or Berlin, maybe your ancestors did, but more significantly perhaps, that's where you did business. So-and-so, the guy who does business with Berlin. If your name referred to size, Mr. Klein, Mr. Gross, whether you were short, whether you were tall, your occupation, I gave the example of Schneider, a tailor, and all kinds of other names that refer to occupations. It could be son of mother, son of father. And in Eastern European Jewish names, we have a lot of son of the mother, like Gittelson, the son of Gittel. Rifkin is the son of Rifka. Now we turn to think of Jews having a patrilineal line and a very male-oriented society, to be sure, but not always, and given the names, it's a good example. In the uh, lecture that I suggested that everybody take a look at, and if you haven't, it's still available, look at our last week's e-blast. The combination of names, very, very common with Jews, and sometimes with non-Jews as well. So starting off with the first part of your name, it could be a metal. So, so many Jews have names that begin with gold, or zilber, silver, or eisen, iron, and then ending with berg, or stein, or tal. Colors, red, white, black, blue. I once tried to make a list of names of rabbis I know. I have known a rabbi black, a rabbi white, lots of rabbis green, and there was in England a very well-known reform rabbi, Lionel Blue. I've yet to find a rabbi orange or rabbi purple, but I guess if we look hard enough, we will. Uh, animal names, and ending with names that end with tree or forest, like Baum or Wald. Interesting how our names came to us. Way back when, Jews did not have family names. Your name could be just the way you were referred to. Moshe the Tall. Moshe the Tailor. And your son could have, or your daughter, a different last name. Then the Austrian government, I think they were the first to do it, insisted that Jews have last names for registration purposes. And government officials, like the census people who used to go from door to door, would list people, and sometimes the names would be given to them that way. Sometimes we know the story behind how our names came to us. If the family was in the tailoring business. We were goldsmiths. Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes things get mixed up. And worst of all, this happens in every situation. You ask your parent, you ask your grandparent, they're too embarrassed to say they really don't know. So they try to think up a good answer, which you take to be factual truth. But oftentimes that's the best we can deal with. Today, in this country, we can't be sure about anything regarding names. I mentioned a little bit about this last time when we were talking about first names of Jews. Jews of color may have specific first names that don't sound Jewish at all. And Jews who are, let's say, Jews for 15 generations back break the tradition there's no longer a Moshe in the family. It used to be Milton or Marvin. Now we find something else that begins with an M because it sounds more up to date. Israeli Jews Hebraicize their names. But given the large numbers of Jews who have married people 
who aren't of Jewish origin, you certainly cannot tell from last names what a person is, whether the person is a Jew or not. I was thinking I might use our temple directory as an example. I didn't get around to doing it, but I was going to give myself this assignment. I'll give you the background of the assignment. I think I mentioned this last time too. Um, back in 1970 something, in a course in American Jewish history, we were required to find out what occupational patterns were of Jews in certain towns, in certain places. I was assigned to Milwaukee from 1880 to 1900, I think that's what it was. And uh, you would go through the city directory, look for Jewish names and see what they did. Well, Milwaukee was problematic because there were a lot of people of German origin in Milwaukee. Is this guy a Jew or isn't he? And uh, you would be tending to think, it was uh, arguing in a circle, if the guy's name were, all right, take a name that could be either Jewish or not Jewish. Schwartz, Schwartz, Black. If Mr. Schwartz is a tailor, you may think he's Jewish. But that's arguing in a circle. So the first half of my paper, which I still have a copy of somewhere or another, was to argue about how my results weren't very valid, for which I got credit for using that methodology. We can't be sure. We can't be sure, let's say, when we look at temple directories, uh, we should take an example. It's too hard to go through the whole thing, so take one page. How many last names, if you heard them out of context, you'd say, I don't know if this person's Jewish. And then you look at first names. There's certain first names that you may think are specifically Jewish. Now, there was a very famous uh, scene in one of the Archie Bunker All in the Family series, and if I remember it correctly, where Archie is trying to say to Edith, that Jews try to hide their identity. They may change their last name to Smith, but their first name is uh, specifically Jewish, like Abe Smith. And we have Jews with the name of Smith. We have Jews with the name of Smith in this congregation, in my previous congregation, a rabbi that I knew who just tragically passed away a few days ago, his last name was Smith. So, you know, Abe Smith, oh, says he, Edith and then assumes that somebody else with the name of Abe Lincoln is also Jewish, Abe Lincoln. Now, this is a Rabbi Lincoln. I know the guy. He was in Chicago, then in New York, okay? Last names don't prove a thing. And sometimes not just because of intermarriage, but because of how names were changed. So I want this to be something of a, an enjoyable exercise to expand our horizons, not to limit them. We can't be sure as to who is who. And we do know that people did change their names intentionally, not just to make it easier for business, but to disguise their identity. Maybe they didn't want to be Jews at all. Maybe they were very, very loyal Jews but wanted to make life easier for their children so there wouldn't be that kind of stigma before they were even met. I give the example of the job application. I could also give the example of the college application, and I'm gonna give a specific example with the college application in a moment. So you're filling out your job application, and um, you see that, uh, you know, the person's name is Goldberg. Well, you don't want to hire Jews. You don't even give the guy a chance. If you have a name that is uh, non-committal in any sort of way, a generic name that could be anything, maybe the person would have a chance and the same with college applications. In my own cynicism, and I was just mentioning this the other day, as I, I had to uh, enclose a picture with applications to graduate school, even to the Hebrew Union College, they wanted a little picture of me. So what did you do in those days? You went to one of those machines, so for 25 cents, instead of hiring a photographer for several hundred dollars, you took a few of your pictures, you cut one off and you sent it in. And I joked around, but it's not a joking matter. They couldn't ask what my race was, 
but maybe they could tell by my picture. I hope that wasn't an issue at the Hebrew Union College, but it was in graduate school and it is in other places as well. So names tell us who we are, names tell us what our family history is, and in the uh, lecture that we had the chance to see, there was also the record of people who changed their names to something innocuous, and then their children or grandchildren changed back to a Jewish name. It's a fun exercise. May it never be used against anybody. Let us not think when we see somebody who doesn't look Jewish. And that could mean somebody with a very, very dark skin on the one extreme, or somebody who is as blonde as can be on the other. Let us not assume anything about that person. Let us not assume if we hear a weird name that the person isn't Jewish. The rabbi of the Park Avenue Synagogue in New York, a conservative congregation, his last name is Cosgrove. It was anglicized by a grandfather in England, and in one or another of his publications, he gets around to saying that this paternal grandfather was in fact Jewish. Otherwise, you'd start making conclusions. And one of the rules I would say is stop making conclusions, even though we can't help it. Sometimes it's none of our business. Sometimes we're intellectually curious, and you wait until the person tells you. So I hope you have, I want to use the word enjoy in a very positive sense, my contribution to this discussion. We're not going to have feedback today because, as I told you, I recorded this on Monday. It will be made available on Tuesday. And then next week, look at the weekly e-blast to see what we're doing. I may not be able because it is our wedding anniversary, we want to do some celebrating, though who knows how on earth you're going to do anything this day and age. Uh, you're afraid to go out to eat. At least we're being very, very cautious about that. And then over July, I will do a few programs, but when you looked for the uh, program that we featured this week and the one last week, they're part of a column of things on the Facebook. Uh, yeah. Uh, of the, uh, the, the website, the website, I should say, the website of the Hebrew Union College, huc.edu, and there are all kinds of wonderful lectures. This is one of the new benefits of the tragedy that we're going through, benefits, that a lot of public lectures that were only available in person, or you had to pay to get in, now we can watch them in our own living rooms or our own dining rooms, and enjoy them and learn from them. Now, if there are any questions that come up, you know how to text me, email me, phone me if necessary. There used to be a column, and I'm racking my brains out what Jewish newspaper it was in. What does my name mean? And there are people who specialize in Jewish names, and there are names that you and I may not for a moment think are Jewish, but really are from out of the way places. And I'm not talking about really out of the way places. We are thinking of in American terms of names that are typically Jewish. There are lots of names that are typically Jewish that you don't find too often around here, but let's say would have in Poland or in Russia. So send me your questions, take care of yourself, be well, and let's move forward and continue learning. And we can start by learning about ourselves. Ask, try to find out what your family name is, and don't just keep it yourself. Share bits and pieces of your family history with your grandchildren, with your great-grandchildren. Let them know how you got the name you got. Let them know also what their Jewish names are, their first names. They may be called something or another in English, they have a Hebrew name. Where did it come from? And let us continue this tradition and be healthy while we're doing it. Thanks for listening. Okay?